Italy, we'll see what happens. Thank you for the honor, and I'm very pleased to be here, finally arriving in, back in England after several years of uh, absence due to COVID. Let me start with some remarks about shops and signatures. This is sort of a bookend to my final paragraph. A craftsman's shop, a bindery, for example, certainly one in a major city like London, where the livery companies held forth, was, premised, was long premised on a hierarchical and regulated basis. At the head was the master, below there were journeymen, and at the bottom, apprentices doing their seven-year stint. If trained as a bookbinder, <clears throat> a journeyman might move about as a jobber, working from shop to shop on an as-needed basis and offering a particular expertise, cutting, folding, finishing. Or in search of obtaining additional skills, a journeyman might attach himself to a particular master. Eventually, a journeyman might emerge, and as a master establish his own bindery, or he might move on to a provincial center where he also might trade as a printer, bookseller, and stationer. There is an interesting contradiction in mastery. The end product from a, from a craftsman was commonly an example of artfulness, a ratio, the production of an, of an object sufficiently pristine in its finish to suggest anonymity, essentially the removal of an auctorial presence. But as a collector, such author, but for a collector, such authorship was commonly crucial. Why else would anyone pursue a particular acquisition? Overcoming this anonymity in binding, overcoming this anonymity in binding, sorry, a, 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 okay, overcoming this particular, let me find myself for a second. Overcoming this particular, this anonymity and binding, there is often a, peculiar, a peculiarity present, a style, essentially as nameless individuality, marked by the use of particular tools and their arrangement. To avoid anonymity, a proper name might be appended. In book binding, whether as an act of artistic vanity, much like an artist's signature, but just as likely as advertising. This association between the maker and the, and the maid took the form of a printed ticket with the master's name pasted in on an inside cover, and I show you some examples on the screen now. What we don't have are any affixed names from the workmen below, the journeymen. In a few instances, by happenstance, we can identify some by name, but of their biographical details, we know little. Most are just lost to history. One exception is the man whose story I will now relate, the remarkable and peripatetic Nathaniel Price, sometimes a journeyman and other times a master. In June 2000, a conference was held in, a, in Rochester, New York, at the Rochester Institute of, of Technology. It was a commemoration of the gift of, Bern, of, of the purchase of Bernard Middleton's uh, bookbinding collection by the Institute. Amongst the various bindings exhibited was an oddity, the covers of a book of Common Prayer, Oxford, 1809. This certainly did not appear like a fine binding. In terrible condition, it appeared to be poorly crafted, and in a rather unfamiliar manner, it was signed not on a ticket, but boldly on the spine. Bound by end price, perfectly dark. Inside, an unsigned and undated note explained this odd labeling. This royal prayer book was bound by Nathaniel Price in the shop of Mr. Carl Tober, note with a C, not the traditional K, Greek Street Soho, a wonderful proof of patience and perseverance, he being quite blind. Some years later, my wife Judy, in the course of her research on Christian Samuel Kaltober, took up the question raised by the insert. Although not exactly central to her research, it was in any case seemingly an interesting problem unto itself. Just who was this blind book maker, binder, and what was his connection to Kaltober? And that is where I became involved. She, she continued working on mainline Kaltober problems, and I began to look into this apparent peripheral oddment, mostly from the question of just who was the blind binder? What was the largest story? Thanks to Google, a starting point, an early entry into Price's biography quickly came up on a brief entry, in a brief entry, in James Wilson's 1821 biography of the blind, including the lives of all those from Homer down to the present day, who have distinguished themselves as poets, philosophers, artists, and so forth. From the book trade, only two persons are named, Wimprecht of Augsburg, an 18th century de dealer, 
and Nathaniel Price. The entry for Price reads, Nathaniel Price was a bookseller in, of Norwich. On quitting business in that city, a, exported goods to a considerable amount from London to America, and on the, his voyage thither, lost his sight in consequence of a severe cold. After much distress and fatigue, he at length arrived in his native country. After an absence of nearly five years, he has since his loss of sight, he has since his loss of sight followed the employment of a bookbinder and found several books in the, in the first style and is indeed the first instance of a blind man being capable of binding books that I have ever heard of. As proof of his abilities, there is a quarto Bible elegantly bound by him, which is now with the Marquis of Blandford's library, Sion Hill in Oxfordshire. <laughs> Another such inspirational volume, 1829, by one Gavin Douglas, has a derivative entry, but also adds that Price exhibited himself in London in 1813, working at the copper plate business, and the clothes he wore were at the, of his own making. With these, <coughs> excuse me, with these two notices, we had a starting point. However, turning to the standard contemporary listings of booksellers and binders, there is no Nathaniel Price listed, mentioned in, for example, the 1785 London and Country Booksellers and Stationers Vid Mecham, nor, is it, nor in the pages for Norwich in the Universal Directory of, of Trade, 1795. And in our own time, he's not in Ramsden's uh, bookbinders outside London, nor in Howe's and Ramsden's London bookbinders, nor, most importantly, does he appear in David Stoker's extensive list of those who worked in the Norwich book trade prior to 1800. But acknowledging Price's existence and, and the pursuit of his trade, we do have an April 1782 report in the Norwich and Bury Register. On Saturday last, it reads, Mary Metcalf was, convict, was con committed to the city jail by J.G. Blakely, Esquire Mayor, charged with stealing privately from the pocket of Nathaniel Price bookbinder the sum of six shillings. In picking up Price's story from this morsel of information, a researcher moves on to a rare 1813 publication, a pamphlet of Price's own writing, the authentic and interesting narrative of Nathaniel Price, from which much information about his career to that point can be got, gleaned. More about this item soon. But therein, Price declares that he was born in London and served my apprenticeship in St. Paul's Churchyard in the book, in the book line. A search of Mackenzie's edition of the Stationers Company ap Apprentices does indeed confirm that Nathaniel Price, son of the late Hugh Price, a, a gentleman once of Old Fish Street, was apprenticed one November 1774 for seven years to George Page, a binder whose premises were in London Yard, the north side of St. Paul's. If he entered Page's shop at the traditional age of 14, this would place his birth at circa 1760-61. With a deceased father, a gentleman, was he placed there as a dispossessed younger son for whom a, a respectable trade was being sought? Alec Howe has George Page at this address till 1777 when he presumably died. Following the usual practice, working with another master of, of otherwise unknown identity, Price would then have completed his remaining years by 1781. As the aforementioned newspaper account of his having been pickpocketed implies, by April 1782, age 21, Nathaniel Price was at work in Norwich as a fully sighted binder. Was it a woman in marriage that brought him to Norwich? He does say he married there, and on 20th of June, 1792, he is recorded as marrying at the local church of St. Simon and St. Jude. His bride was Pingrinia Shuckforth from nearby Dis, possibly from a distinguished local clockmaking family. The bachelor groom was 31, the bride, a spinster, was 45. Assuming he had no subsequent wives, Pingrinia was to play an important supportive role in the ongoing adventure of Nathaniel's life. Other than the robbery and his marriage, <clears throat> presently we know nothing, alas, about, and nothing else about his years in Norwich. We must then make a leap and make some simple suppositions about the intervening 13 years, for by his own account, together with Pingrinia, Price is not next known boarding the ship Ocean in July 1795 and in October alighting in New York City. 
Had he remained in Norwich during these intervening years? Had he expanded his book trade in a traditional and one might say provincial manner, becoming a bookseller and stationer as well? Don't know. Certainly in the 1821 biographical notice, certainly the 1821, as the 1821 biographical notice informs us, he did take up bookselling. And in his 1813 pamphlet, Price records that in the years 1794 and 1795, trade was very brisk with America. Did he see opportunity there? Was it, enough, was it enough to leave his life and trade in Norwich? But judging from we know, what we know about his first American contacts, it seems likely that as much as trade might have been a draw, his transatlantic emigration was in large part ideologically driven. Like many an emigre, he may have been looking for better business opportunities, but it appears that he also was looking for something more. Like many an English and Irish radicals in the 1790s, he might have made the crossing out of a fear and fright born of conviction. During the mid-1790s, responding to the execution of Louis XVI and the subsequent excesses of the French Revolution and their possible impact on British life, there had been a severe crackdown on liberal and radical thinking in England. Fox's Libel Act had been enacted in 1792. Habeas Corpus had been suspended in 1794. The Treasonous and Sedition, Seditious Practices Act passed in 1795, and beginning in 1792, there had been a series of treason trials in the country, during the course of which numerous free thinkers and radicals had their lives threatened and were arrested and tried. At the center of this turmoil were writers, pamphleteers, printers, and publishers, the communicators, this, thus, by all accounts, this was a good time to go, to say goodbye to old England and head for not just more welcoming shores, but also to a land where for many, in the tradition of the 18th century commonwealthmen, uh, the promise of the English Constitution had been, had been or could be more completely fulfilled, the new United States. And they did so depart. Joseph Priestley, for example, whose Birmingham house you see here being burned down in 1791, moved to Hackney and in 1794 fled to exile in Pennsylvania. Joseph Gales, proprietor of the Sheffield Register, also fled to Pennsylvania, settling in there by 1795. Thomas Paine was perhaps the most public of this group of exiles. After being charged with sedition following the publication of the Rights of Man in 1792, he was scheduled for trial in December. However, by then he had fled to France. But, did, and, but he tried desperately to, get to, to manage to get to America to get, but he didn't get there until 1802. Assuredly, Paine and Price never met, but as a thinker and writer, Paine appears to have had a, a looming presence in the lives and thoughts of nearly all those who, like Prince Price, sorry, thought security, sought security by crossing the Atlantic. He was a kind of ideological synecdoche that linked many of these parts. I found thus far the names of 19 who, uh, Printers, publishers who emigrated between the years 1793 and 1796, emigrated to America. Had Price been radicalized in Norwich, where a recent study of the city during the pertinent years has pointed out, which has pointed out, was known as the Jacobin City? Had he been a member of the Norwich Re Revolution Society, or the Norwich Patriot Society, or the United Constitution Society? Thus, was it Price's politics and the accompanying fears for his personal safety? that led Nathaniel and Pingrenia to set sail for New York in July 1795. Once arrived in New York, that is Manhattan Island, Price relates that he, his first call was on a Mr. Wayland at 151 Water Street. But picking up on the underlying reasons for his coming to New York, I would like to suggest that this was not just some random knock, knock on a door, for Le Levi Wayland was yet another of those, screen, those printer publishers in exile. From 1789 to 1793, Wayland had a shop in Holborn. From 1787 onwards, he was also active as a publisher, issuing such titles as Portrait of the British Constitution, an important extract from, the, from a tract entitled The Birthright of Britons, or the same year, an abolitionist sermon, Commerce in the Human Species and the Enslavement of Innocent Persons, inimical to the laws of Moses and the gospel of Christ. Again, in 1792, he published Thomas Paine's pamphlet, Paine, Dundas, 
and, Os and Onslow a letter to Mr. Henry Dundas. And the next year, Wayland was a signee of the Declaration of the Friends to the Liberty of the People. Were things getting too hot for him in London? Did he too live in, New in fear of the Libel Act? In any case, by 1794, Wayland was in New York where he resumed his political activities. Right. From 17, oh, by, by November, by November, that is, he landed in 1794, by November 1794, he was co-editing and publishing a briefly lived newspaper, the New York Evening Post. But that year, he also published an American edition of the trial of David Isaac Eaton for, pub for publishing a supposed libel comparing the King of England to a gamecock, and that was on the previous slide. Importantly for Price, Leyland was also a founder of the New York Society for the Information and Assistance of Persons Emigrating for foreign from Foreign Countries, an organization that, as it said, sought to obtain for such persons suitable employment according to their respective characters and professions. Unfortunately, on his arrival, Price found that Wayland was suffering from yellow fever, which in those decades routinely recurred in New York and other American cities. He told Price that once recovered, he looked forward to seeing him again, but sadly, that never happened. Having relapsed, Wayland died of the disease within days of this initial meeting. In any, any case, he did successfully convince Price to avoid Manhattan, New York, the upper part of what you see there, and move instead to the western end of Long Island, specifically that part we think of as Brooklyn. A healthier place which Price recalled Wayland describing as the Garden of America. And if you look, you can contrast the sort of a landscape uh, indications um, in Brooklyn as opposed to the gridiron street, the grid street pattern of uh, Manhattan. A healthier place which recall, Re Wayland recalled describing, which Price recalled Wayland describing as the Garden of America. Taking Wayland's advice, that is just where the prices did settle. But working through these same political circles, networking, as we would now say, hard upon his arrival, Price was working as a jobbing binder. His home, his residence, and business premises was at the junction of Fulton and Sand Street, and that's the lower blue arrow pointing just about where his home was, uh, and near the Methodist Church, a local landmark erected in 1794. So his address is always near the Methodist Church. Curiously, in the Brooklyn Directory for 1796, he is not listed as a binder. Indeed, no binders are listed in his direct directory at all, nor was he included as a bookseller. Only Robert Hodge, another English emigre, whose shop was likewise said to be opposite the church, has that designation. Instead, he was entered as a copper plate printer, this being a trade that he had presumably learned during his Norwich years, possibly to complement his bookselling business. Otherwise, all of Price's known employment as a binder was across the East River in New York. He was a commuter. He found work with at least two booksellers, like the deceased Wayland, both were on Water Street, a main focus of the trade. Even Hodge, his Brooklyn neighbor, had his principal shop on Water Street. With some purpose, let me show you this area, what this area of New York looked like at the time. This is a 1797 view of the Tontin Coffee House, in a certain sense, the forerunner of the New York Stock Exchange, on, it was on Wall Street. And to the, the street running off diagonally to the left is Weaver Street, is Water Street, sorry. <laughs> is Water Street. The artist is Francis Guy, an English silk dyer, an accomplished topographical artist, and yet another recent arrival from England. Price acknowledges meeting Guy, who assisted him in finding accommodation in Brooklyn, where Guy was already settled. At the time of Price's arrival, Guy was in partnership with another English dyer, John Harmer. We know very little about Harmer. An early history of Brooklyn describes Harmer as a singular genius and a great infidel. I mean, he also was said to have been a close friend to Thomas Paine. Very likely, he and Guy were moving in the same political circles with which Price was becoming increasingly involved. Specifically, the New York Democratic Republicans, the populist followers of Thomas Jefferson. Within a month, within a month of Wayland's November death, Price was, was on Water Street binding for Thomas Greenleaf. On, on, an American associate of Wayland in the Society for Information and Assistance. At his death in 1798, Greenleaf would be eulogized as a steady, as an already uniform, zealous supporter of the rights of humanity, a warm friend to civic and religious liberty. 
A recurring advert from Greenleaf's New York Journal, here, 21st December 1791, that is on the left, announced that Greenleaf provided binding, gilding, and blank book ruling. As for binding, the, this notice continues that in order to give the most ample satisfaction to his customers in his general business, as binding is closely allied with printing, Mr. Greenleaf has employed a complete binder, gilder, and ruler at an extraordinary salary, and will engage that, that everyone who may be pleased to employ him shall be satisfied or no pay, and that all the work which may be done shall be charged quite as low as the current prices. This in-house aspect of his business continued. Indeed, just weeks after Price landed in New York, a notice in another Greenleaf newspaper, the Argus, 17th December 1795, informed readers, Thomas Greenleaf carries on the bookbinding business in an elegant manner. Had this notice been prompted by his hiring of the recently arrived and experienced English binder, Nathaniel Price? We know that Price also worked for Naftali Judah, a sometime publishing partner of Greenleaf's. His shop, same street, was at the, at the sign of the Payne's Head. Back to Thomas Paine. Again, Thomas Paine. And as these ad advertisements make clear, Judah was yet another bookseller providing binding services. Throughout his years in America, through all of Price's yet to be discussed travels and travails, Judah would remain a fast and importantly a generous friend. Looking further, looking further, <coughs> excuse me, looking further into Price's possible networking. Another part of contact, point of contact, may have been the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of New York, founded in 1786 and comprised largely of radical democratic Republicans, artisans who in the light of natural law sought life, liberty, and property. Here is their membership certificate. Judah and Greenleaf were both members, as was Price's Brooklyn neighbor, Hodge. In the absence of guilds and livery companies, the society assumed a key protectionist role in controlling apprenticeships and formalizing other aspects of a variety of trades. Did the society also function a bit like in a labor exchange, providing opportunities for work, as well as a sense of fraternity for those newly arrived? For whatever reason, whether for additional income or as he was advised to keep his wife involved and employed during the weekdays when he was away binding on the other side of the river, within months of their arrival, the prices had opened a tea and coffee house in their home. Of their, of their location, he would, Price would later recall, it was pleasantly situated on the roadside and a place of great resort of a Sunday for the people of New York, it being a pleasant ride across the ferry. It was this undertaking, it was with this undertaking that Nathaniel Price's whole life abruptly took a tragic turn. To assist his wife with this business and other domestic chores, in May 1797, the Prices hired a young servant girl, Eunice Williamson, the niece of a neighbor who was perhaps 12 years old. What Douglas, what, Douglas Price, what Douglas Price's early, bio, early biographer did not disclose in, this brief bio, in his brief biography of, of the binder, or, or maybe he just didn't know it, is that during the following July, Nathaniel Price was arrested for child rape. After about a fortnight's employment, while Pingrinier was out marketing, Nathaniel Price was said to have forced himself upon this child. He was said to have bound, gagged, and ravished Eunice. Eunice. And if she told anyone about what had happened, he supposedly told her he would kill her and throw her away. Curiously, Eunice was said to have remained in the Price household for a week after the event. And it was only two months later when she took ill that this purported assault was publicly disclosed, disclosed and he was finally arrested for this appalling crime. On August 29, 1797, Price was tried, and this is the published, published record of his trial. Trial of the, the, tri the trial of Nathaniel Price for committing a rape on the body of Eunice Williamson, a child between 10 and 11 years old of age at Brooklyn and Kings County in May 1797. I add only that his sentence, when he was convicted, his sentence was life imprisonment and hard labor. So much for, possibly so much for the life of Nathaniel Price Binder. It is from this account that we learn of the aforementioned work for Greenleaf and Judah, both of whom were called as character witnesses on his behalf. Greenleaf, who had hired him in December, acknowledged that Price's general character was good. Judah noted that he employed him for nine months and that his conduct was regular and proper, that he had good, kept good hours in the evening, and he went home to Brooklyn to his wife every Saturday evening. 
From witnesses called to testify about Eunice, there was conflicting testimony. One claiming that she was not a good girl, another testified that she was wild and rattle-brained, and her, in her favor, still another recalled that she could read the Bible and she was fond of her book and a good girl. Supportive testimony on Price's behalf, including medical evidence from two physicians, proved useless. As old questions about the, and as did questions about the curiously lengthy lapse of time between the act and its disclosure. Although in most such cases, such charges were commonly questioned, for children were rarely trusted in the witness chair, it was ultimately Eunice's own testimony, given with intimate detail, that seems to have done Price in. After a single day's trial and jury deliberations of an hour, Nathaniel Price was found guilty. The next day, he was sentenced to life at hard labor in the state prison. He was then 37 years old. Not surprisingly, he would forever declare his innocence of this charge, perhaps justly. Now Price got lucky. At the time of his sentencing, the new state penitentiary over in Manhattan, New York, was still several months away from completion. In the interim, he was placed in the recently built jail that joined the courthouse where he'd been tried. This was a flimsy facility of which it was said at the time, prisoners were in great danger of falling out. To prevent any such tumbles, Price was securely bolted to the floor with case-hardened chains, to which cuffs were attached that held his ankles by a, by a bolt across. Nevertheless, despite these precautions, within days of being sentenced, Price did fall out. Once jailed, he was fortunate to fall in with two seasoned cellmates, old offenders as he describes them. They were sympathetic to his fate, and fortunately for Price, not only did they know the facility and its weaknesses, well, but they also were prepared to include him in their own plans for escape. First, they tried freeing Price from his chains with a smuggled-in file, but the steel was unyielding. Finally, after struggling for hours, one of these companions, basely described as a man of great strength, did succeed in unscrewing and releasing the bolts on the cuffs. Once Price was relieved, the three overwhelmed the guard, and they were out gone, each going his own way. Cutting his hair, assuming a new name, indeed, during this lengthy escapade, he probably assumed a whole variety of names, Price was now on the road, an escaped convict in search of a safe haven. Before addressing That is the uh, copy of the, uh, the pamphlet sorry, that I actually put up, uh, which describes the trial. And there you see, in the second paragraph down on the right, uh, the beginnings of the description of the crime uh, at the beginning of May, 1797. And he's talking about her tying her hands with a cord and her mouth with a handkerchief and so forth. Be <coughs> excuse me. Before addressing the activities each of his various stops made during his many months uh, as an escapee on the run, let's take a look at this map to see just where he did go during his remaining time in Philadelphia, actually North America. It's easier for me. I hope that you all have a sense of American geography. So the second arrow down is, uh, the third arrow down, sorry, is New York, where he, uh, where he settled. Uh, and then the, if you go down below that, you come to Philadelphia, where he next went, then to Brandywine, Delaware, where he went, then back to Philadelphia, then the arrow to the left of that is Baltimore, where he then went. Then he went back to Philadelphia, uh, which is the, the fourth arrow up. And from Philadelphia, he went to Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is the arrow at the top. And from uh, Halifax, he went to Boston, which is the second arrow down. So as you can see, it was a bit of a meandering. Now to some, now to some known specifics of this bookbinder's flight. Leaving Brooklyn, initially Price thought of traveling north to Boston. He decided instead to go south and made his way to Philadelphia. Somewhat surprisingly, for these first days and weeks of the flight, I would have expected to find some kind of wanted notice for Price as an escaped prisoner. Thus far, I have found nothing. There was an abundance of such adverts for escaped slaves, indentured servants, and fleeing apprentices, but escaped convicts' notices are far fewer, possibly because far fewer escaped. But most, most, most of these notices include a name, a physical description, a comment on their clothing, and for many, on the assumption that at some point, some form of employment would be sought, a description of their working skill. Their trade is, is always given. If such a notice for Price never did appear, just the possibility of being out there would have been unnerving. With a tinge of paranoia, he must always have been looking over his shoulder. Indeed, he fled his initial stop in Philadelphia when a New York banknote he tried to change proved to be counterfeit. 
and he feared he would be arrested, identified, and returned to prison. Very quickly, he returned to the road. Price's next destination was Brandywine. Was it his search for some tucked away, new, uh, tucked away refuge that brought him to the small hamlet of Brandywine? He would have arrived in late 1797, and in all likelihood, his arrival there was more than just a coincidence, for it ended up on the doorstep of another escaped convict of radical persuasion, the Irish patriot Archibald Hamilton Rowan, a founding member in 1791 of the, United, of the Dublin Society of United Irishmen. The following year, Rowan had been arrested and tried, to, tried for sedition. Finally, in 1794, Finally, in 1794, he was sentenced on this charge to two years in prison. Anticipating that an additional charge of treason was forthcoming, he managed to flee. Bolting from a Dublin jail, Rowan made his way to Paris. <clears throat> yes, he apparently knew Thomas Paine there. Next, he went to where, where else but Philadelphia, arriving 4th of July, 1795. Fearing discovery and extradition, sedition being one of the few charges applicable in that legal process, Rowan then went underground, settling eventually in obscure Brandywine. From there, oh, once there, he found a supposedly knowledgeable partner, a one-time dyer from Manchester, and in March 1797, he bought a calico printing business. At the end of the year, Price turned up on his doorstep. Avoiding book binding, an obvious threat to his disclosure, was the sometime copper plate printer seeking shelter and employment as a printer instead. The problem was that calico printing was a trade being done with wood, wood blocks. In any case, Rowan's business was already in the doldrums, being badly affected, as with much trade in the Delaware Valley, by a recent outbreak of yellow fever in Philadelphia. In any case, Rowan was anything but a seasoned book businessman. As Price summarized, regardless of his, his expectations, Rowan was, as he, said, as he said, was not carrying on any kind of business, for his premise, premises was nothing but a little hut. But as the swatches show, he eventually did get the thing going but Price did not stick around. Fearing detection when another visitor unexpectedly arrived, Price was off again. However, there may have been yet another dimension in Price's returning to Rowan. He may, oops, yeah. He may, have been, he may have been seeking assistance in turning his flight from justice into a flight for justice for his exoneration from the charge of child rape. In 1788, Rowan had involved himself in the case of a 12-year-old rape victim a Dublin girl, Mary Neal. A purported gentleman had asked Mary to carry a message to what turned out to be a local brothel. Once arrived, she was rushed inside and viciously deboshed, is the term that was used, by the Earl of Carhampton. He was never charged, and although charged, the lady brothel keeper was eventually let off by the benefit of falsified testimony. However, the real victims in what became a well-publicized case were the unfortunate little Mary, who was named as a prostitute, and her parents were jailed on a trumped-up robbery charge. A widely recognized champion of the poor, Rowan fought hard, alas, unsuccessfully, to redeem the child's good name and against the terrible injustice suffered by her parents. All he subsequently uh, documented in this 1788 pamphlet. Had Price imagined that Rowan might also be useful in his own campaign, to clear, in the campaign to clear his own name? Leaving Brandywine, Price returned to Philadelphia, stopping with another old and supportive friend, an otherwise unknown Englishman, Mr. Eaton, who, whose wife he did not trust. Price records receiving, he said he got a little money from Mr. J, New York. And, the, and then I immediately went on board a vessel bound for Baltimore. And this again is Naftali Judah, the man who had employed him when he first arrived in New York. But finding no work in Baltimore and the ubiquitous yellow fever raging there as well, it was once more back to Philadelphia. This time he committed to remaining in the city, the nascent national capital, albeit only temporarily, and a city which, as already noted, was sheltering several prominent English radical exiles. Philadelphia was also a center of the book trade. Consequently, as this local, as the 1796 local advert indicates, this is just the time he was getting there, it was a city in need of book binders. And this is a, the other one is an ad for Washington, the, new, the city of Washington uh, for 1800, showing the same need. But, Once there, uh, once there, Baltimore, in Philadelphia, perhaps at a pecuniary necessity, by late in 1797, Price, or whatever he was then calling himself, reemerged as a binder. By his, own, by his own account, I got work at a Mr. Aikens, and by letter to, to Mr. J of New York, my wife soon arrived with a supply of money. Again, the ever-beneficial uh, Naftali Judah. 
A Scot, Robert Aiken, had trained as a binder prior to his emigration to the, to the colonies, to Philadelphia, where he settled in 1771. In addition to the binder, he was also active as a printer, bookseller, and stationer. Indeed, without attempting to identify his politics in the late 1790s, what should be noted is that in 1775 and the year following, which was the eve of the revolution, Aiken had founded and published Pennsylvania Magazine. It ran for 12 issues. And who was his editor of choice? Roger P Thomas Paine, <laughs> who had recently arrived in the city with a letter of introduction from another local printer, one Benjamin Franklin. Payne also provided a good bit of the magazine's content. On leaving his editorship, Payne enlisted in the American Army, and with his American Crisis, published in December 17, 1776, he would emerge as the master of revolutionary rhetoric. Yet again, one can ask if it was a political network that opened a door for Price. From the collections of the American Philosophical Society, on the left you see a series of plain bindings done by Aiken for the Society, just about the time Price was employed there. And representative of Aiken's finer work are several variously dated bindings now in the collection of the American Antiquarian Society. But Price's timing was bad. Yellow fever was in the city and little work was available. Suffering from a lack of trade as well as a series of bad investments, speculations in uncollected debts, the bookseller, bookseller always being the last one to be paid, In 1797, just when Price was in his shop, Aiken recorded in his waste book that he was pinched beyond measure, unable to purchase a ream of paper to retail in my shop. If this downturn in trade and the resultant lack of work was an inadequate reason for Price to move on, there was always his recurring anxiety, his lurking fear of recognition. I discovered several people who knew me in New York, he would recall, a scare which was enough to put him on his to flight once more. By ship, he now made his way to Halifax, Nova Scotia. Why seek safety in Nova Scotia, in Halifax? Possibly because the city being in Canada, there were no extradition procedures then in place between the UK and the US, other than for murder and forgery. Moreover, the likelihood of Price's running into a familiar place in Halifax was much less likely. But Price also discovered that there were no, was no real book trade in the city. The only local employment opportunities were in the Royal Dockyard, the home base of the Royal Navy in North America. Unable to find a place for himself by his own account, Price remained in Halifax for only a week, after which, taking his chances, he found passage back to the US. He arrived in Boston in mid-1796. <clears throat> Work was soon found, <clears throat> and he remained in Boston about two years. He identifies his local employers as the Messrs. West, that is, the brothers David and John West and Joseph Nancraid. What cannot be established is just how Price came to either of these stops. Was it through any continuing political connection, connection? Although by then, the fears that the reign of terror and its legacy might spread abroad seemed to have diminished the revolutionary zeal of many of British and American radicals. More to the point, Boston was a conservative city. Politically, its sympathies were with the Federalists who favored a strong central government with leadership from an educated elite. Seeking work, did he go about knocking on doors, or might he again have come across ads for such a position in the local press? There was also the possibility of making contact through the associated mechanics of the town of Boston, like the New York Society, an organization established to ensure that all mechanics hired in the town had served proper apprenticeships. David West and five other binders were foundation members. You see here the, the foundation document and West's name appended. The West seemed to have been in and out of partnership. The West seemed to have been in and out of partnership. David West, the, the elder, was already a bookseller at age 22 in 1787. You see him here in a 1796 portrait by Christian Gulliger, a Danish emigre painter. Together with the front page of a catalog from the time Price was possibly working with him. John the Younger was also known to advertise himself as a binder. Nancreda, a Frenchman, properly Paul Joseph Gerard Nancreda, had been an instructor in French at Harvard until 1795 when he was dismissed from his post. That is when, abbreviated as Joseph Nancreed, he became a bookseller and publisher instead. Not unexpectedly, he is known to have specialized in French texts, even issuing several of his own translations into English. Once an enthusiastic supporter of the French Revolution, a Girondist, but as with many, it was the Jacobin, excess, Jacobin excesses that had dissipated his revolutionary fervor. 
to conjecture. His 1798 extensive catalog of books imp uh, imported from London, which you see on the right, uh, includes a translation from the French of Derouliere's 1797 history of the revolution in Russia, neatly bound and lettered, the only item so, so described. Coincidence, perhaps? But could this house binding have been from Price's hand? Judging from his biographical account, despite the passage of time and all these, char and all these changes in place, the peripatetic Price never did feel secure. Real or imagined, he lived with a constant threat of discovery. His life could be turned topsy-turvy at any moment. There was the incident of the banknote, and hearing what seemed a familiar voice in the middle of the night when at an inn in New Jersey, or it may have been a glance of recognition when passed by a carriage driven, he thought, by one of the constables who had taken him to prison. Risk was his constant companion. Whether in search of consolation or advice, he eventually opened his mind, as he put it, to a prominent Boston clergyman, the Reverend Samuel Stillman. Had Price become a lost and disillusioned soul? Like the pain of the ancient reason, perhaps he had lost one faith and was seeking another in this time of want? The minister's advice, as Price records, was go to England as soon as possible. And as quickly as he could, Price did just that. Able to afford only one passage, Price signed onto a ship as a gunner's mate and paid for his wife's ticket on another vessel. Departing just prior to Christmas 1799, in February 1800, a fully sighted Price stepped ashore in Bristol Settling in the city, presumably under his own name, he was soon very back, very soon back, working as a binder, and specifically identifies three Bristol booksellers who employed him. There was John Norton, who also identified as a binder, but is unlisted in Ramsden's provincial binders. Here's an example of his work, and William Brown and a Mr. Shepherd. Looking at various titles published under their respective names, there is no reason to believe that he found these jobs through a political connection. Again, he may have attended a local friendly society. There were many in turn of the century, Bristol, or there were always doors to be knocked on. Professionally and domestically, everything must have seemed fine at least until the summer of 1803. That is when catastrophe struck. When his price records, I lost my sight by sitting in the draft when in a violent perspiration, which brought on pains in different parts of my body and having a heaviness in the eyes, caused an issue of water and an inflammation ensued, which continued for eight days, during which I took nothing but water and when the inflammation subsided, I was totally blind. A year later, after his sight had failed to restore itself and despite visits to an assortment of local ineffectual physicians, funds on his behalf were solicited, an early example of crowdsourcing, I guess, and a visit was made to the Royal Oculist in London. All was to no avail. All consultations and treatments proved useless in alleviating his pain, much less in, under, in curing his underlying condition, the cause of his blindness. However, following the London visit, he evidently decided to remain in the capital, thinking perhaps that long term he was better off there than in some provincial center. It was now that the once-cited bookbinder Nathaniel Price began the, pro the process by which he would become Nathaniel Price, the bookbinder who bound when perfectly dark. As the resourcefulness he exhibited during his time on the run demonstrates, Price was resilient. He was a man possessed of initiative. Only now he was confronted by entirely new challenges, challenges that not only severely affected his uh, mobility, but which also wholly upend upended his vocational means, his livelihood. No longer was he capable of independently working, whether as a binder or a copper plate printer. Nevertheless, he gathered up his strength and went in search of some new means of subsistence. If he could not regain his sight, he would seek out some means of overcoming this unanticipated and debilitating disability. By his own account, age 41, Price now sought admission to the London School for the Indigent Blind, a charity established in 1799 and then housed in a former Southwark tavern. To his dismay, he discovered that he was suitably poor, entry was, but entry was confined to children, the bulk of whom, were aged 12 to 18, were boarders. Furthermore, the only vocational training to offer to boys was, the clo was clothes and sash line and the making of baskets and mats, the weaving of making of baskets and mats. All menial trades, this literate and skilled craftsman had no interest in pursuing. To survive, Price would need to look elsewhere. But just what he did and where he did it prior to the eventual, eventual re-emergence is unknown. During the intervening years, was he actively empl employed at something, anything, 
Or was he pathetically reduced to public beggary? Was he dependent on the parish or some other ch civic charity for support? Did he live for a time in the workhouse? Just how did he survive, and did he succeed in his quest to find an occupational outlet? Certainly it was in London that he reappeared. Almost a decade after being struck blind, on 22nd October 1813, Nathaniel Price made a public presentation. He gave a lecture at the Mansion House, during the course of which he undoubtedly related his gripping story with a focus on his arrest, his trial, the escape, the flight, and finally his loss of sight. Now he stood before his audience as a living testament to what he had suffered, but most importantly, the obstacles he had overcome. We know of this lecture from a subsequent notice, a singular gift of providence in the Times, 4th of November, in which Price publicizes a forthcoming autobiographical pam pamphlet, the primary source for what, much of what I have told you, what is known about his life and career. And the, according to the World Cat, the only copy of that pamphlet is at the New York Historical Society. Can you see it? There, the authentic and interesting narrative of Nathaniel Price, late bookseller and binder, who was sentenced to be imprisoned for life by the Americans for a supposed rape, with the trial and, and, and the execution when with the trial and his ex and ex escape, sorry, when chained to the floor, printed for and sold by the sufferer only, London, 1813. But beyond publicizing this forthcoming publication, the same Times article announced that Nathaniel Price, late bookseller of Norwich, who was totally dark, had obtained a spacious room near the Adelphi. There, after making a discretionary notice and taking notice of a portrait that he had hanging over the door, a full portrait, it said, you and the visitor encountered a remarkable sight. His words, out of gratitude to the nobility and gentry for their liberal encouragement in patronizing his efforts in binding an elegant quarto Bible, which is the Bible he did for Blandford, first mentioned. <clears throat> Price was said to have been stimulated to the cutting out and making of a complete suit of clothes of the best materials, from the shoe to the hat, without any assistance than a child to thread his needle. This extraordinary man is to be seen in the above suit. Must have been quite a sight. Had he transformed himself into an advertisement for himself, into something sort of a memorable public character? But that was not all that was to be seen. At the same time, notice stated, also displayed were, quote, some elegant specimens of his binding. At some time during the decade, since he was struck blind, somewhere along the way, he had evidently not only picked up skills in tailoring, but what is noteworthy for this audience is that at some point, he had also resumed work, not just as a bookbinder, but as a blind bookbinder. We have no real idea of just how many books he bound during this time, much less how many were displayed in 1813. From his hand, only four can be identified, and of these, only two can be located, both in public collections. First, as Price makes clear, not on display in 1813, there was the now lost elegant Blandford binding on an unknown edition of the Bible. Blandford, after 1817, the fifth Duke of Marlborough, was renowned as a book collector, but also as a spendthrift eccentric. There is no mention of the Price binding in Bibliotheca Binfordiensis, the 1812 to 1814 catalog of his extensive library, nor was it included in the 1819 White Knight sale called after his house when he was forced to sell his property because of his extensive debts. With these, what these lists do make clear is that he did have a special interest in historic Bibles. However, regardless of the lauding of this binding of the Blandford Bible, it is unlikely that the underlying book was anything other than a standardly available Bible and a recent edition as well. Why would Blandford, or for that matter, any other bibliophile, have handed over treasure or valued book to such an uncertain hand? If, as is suggested, it had been a commission, can its extending be attributed to his lordship's eccentricity of taste? Was it obtained as an oddity or out of compassion as a noble act of charity? If Lambert had an interest in bindings, might a price binding made in the dark have been a fitting curiosity to be added to his collection? And of its appearance, just what did constitute the elegance of the description? Certainly, along these lines of thought, of a binding as an object to itself and not as an enhancing cover or for, a value or for a value or valuable text, the other three known price bindings are all on an inexpensive and widely available stereotyped 1813 Clarendon edition of the Book of Common Prayer. Essentially, this was an affordable trade edition, the sale of which provided critical income to the Oxford Press. It was, a way, it was their way of underwriting the, uh, their scholastic publications. 
The two available bindings are the Middleton copy at RIT and in the Broxbourne collection at the Bodleian. The fourth, the Avery binding, is known only for published descriptions. Being on an, unauthor on an authorized and inexpensive prayer book, regular usage and frequent handling may well account not just for this stressed condition of the Middleton binding, but suggest that similar price bindings may also have been worn out and discarded. Their novelty and very likely their limited historic and artistic value being disregarded. The Middleton binding. At some point in his quest to resume binding, Price encountered Christian Samuel Coltake. Once regarded, as the, once regarded as the finest binder in England, in 1805, Coltober had closed up his shop, closed up the shop he had established in 1782. In 1808, identifying himself apparently as a journeyman, he had joined a trade society. This, that same year, Carl Tober began working for the French emigre bookseller, the Comte de Comon, whose premises on Gerard Street, Soho, included an in-house bindery. He remained there till May 1814, when with business in a decline, the Comte, aged 71, closed up shop and returned to France. But during this time, probably just about the time Price sought to resume some sort of career as a binder, Carl Tober confidently identified himself as a master, signing the bookbinder's price book dated December 1812. And several signed bindings are known that post-date that signature and come on subsequent departure. The circumstances are unknown, but perhaps it was in search of some charitable assistance that Price encountered Kaltober, just around the time the latter was apparently seeking to re-establish re a shop of his own. Does that explain Kaltober's otherwise unrecorded Greek street address? Was it a compassionate Kaltober who also had encouraged and aided Price with the Blandford Bible? It would be nice to think so. The Middleton binding is of dark blue goatskin. As for the tools, just whose tools were employed, were they Carl Tobers, or did they come from, were they borrowed from Comon, who in any case in 1806 is known to have purchased his tools from Carl Tober, who was actually responsible for the choice of tools. But Price did memory and touch play a role, and for the restrained, and was he who was responsible for the restrained and seemingly undemanding design. The workmanship, suddenly, the workmanship certainly suggests an unsteady and uncertain hand. The forwarding and finishing are slipshod. On the spine, the fillets marking the raised bands are not level or well applied, and the tooled rosettes are noticeably off center. On the covers, the rolled border design presses erratically towards the edge. Hand on hand had Kaltober's helping hand guided Price in applying the punches and rolls and the gilt, and, who's, and who chose and lined up the letters that form the, the text of Price's extensive signature on the spine. And that bold and confident signal, signature, bound by N. Price, perfectly dark, suggests another connection to Carl Tober. Carl Tober commonly signed his own bindings with a paper ticket, but on rare occasions he is known to assign bindings that were sometimes called the French style, something he may have learned from Comon. Instead of a pasted ticket and a gesture and placement that privileged the binder, a stamped signature was included at the base of the spine, as seen here in an Ovid metamorphosis done for Lord Spencer. I hope you can see that in the, in the binding on the left at the very bottom. <clears throat> Price's binding goes further and demonstrates even further the role of title and, and the role, the role of it diminishes even further the, ro the role of the title and gives audacious prominence to the binder's name. Was it Carl Tobin's transition, his unsettled status as he sought to rebuild a business that pressed Price to look elsewhere and brought him to another London bindery, Curtis and Son? <clears throat> Both the Broxbourne binding seen here and the fourth and last identifiable Price binding, the unlocatable Avery binding, once the property of Samuel P. Avery, uh, a prominent New York bibliophile, are linked to this workshop. The note pasted in the Broxbourne binding, sold at Anderson's in 1917 by Louis Lermont, a Montreal collector, and part of Rosenbach stock in 1945, $150, reads in part, this quarto prayer book was bound in my workshop by Nathaniel Price, blind, in the presence of myself and son, Edward Curtis and son, 6 New Street, St. James's. The paper inserted in Mr. Avery's lost binding reads virtually the same, only an additional witness, William Matthews, is named. Edward Curtis, a binder and stationer, was known to have been working on Denmark Street, Westminster, in 1796. Very likely, he was the same Edward Curtis who signed the 1812 Price book as a master. He is last recorded in the 1818 poll book for Dartmouth Street, Westminster. Otherwise, he seems to have gone unnoticed. Only the notes in the Price bindings 
locate Curtis in premises at the lower end of John Nash's new street, that is Regent Street, then only in the beginning of its construction, and in an area intended to house purveyors of luxury goods. In the Middleton, if the Middleton Prayer Book has a somewhat slipshod look, the Broxbourne binding in red Morocco and done in conjunction with the Curtises has a wholly different appearance and raises questions about their particular co collaboration. By contrast, it's well designed and well crafted with its orderly decoration, consisting of a roll, tool, roll, tools, and corner tools, all gilt. It is difficult to attribute anything significant in the finishing to Price's hand, whether guided or unguided, as opposed to the personal contributions of the Curtis, one of their journeymen. Indeed, the state of preservation suggests that even if regularly used for devotions, it also was something admired and cared for. All we really know about the appearance of the fourth known binding, the Avery, comes from the December 1887 American bookmaker, where notice is taken of its recent sale in Sotheby's. It had this brief description. This, the book, after the lapse of perhaps 50 years, was as sound as ever, being covered in old red Morocco, which one so seldom gets nowadays. The tooled lines, though somewhat coarse, met with exactness, and on the whole, it was a very creditable specimen of work. In the March following, <coughs> me, in a letter to the magazine's editor, Avery disclosed his ownership and provided the aforementioned text that linked his purchase to the courtesies. But he also provided the text of an additional insert, a copy of an undated letter which very likely marks this binding as the ostensible end of Nathaniel Price's life as a bookbinder and almost as a mortal being. The binding, this lost binding, <clears throat> had been sent by Price as a gift to shoot Barrington, the Bishop of Durham, and a resident of Cavendish Square. And here is this plaintive cry. May it please your lordship to pardon this intrusion. Permit me to return my grateful and most humble thanks for the different donations your goodness has bestowed on me. Two years back, I bound a Bible now in the possession of the Marquis of Blandford, which you were pleased to see. With the blessing of providence, I completed a pair of prayer book, which I trust will be the last, as I constantly pray for my dissolution, laboring under blindness, rheumatism, etc., etc. Should it be your lordship's pleasure to have the Bible as I humble offer the first sight to your lordship, and any donation that your lordship please to grant will be gratefully re received and ever bound to pray. The Bar that Barrington accepted the gift is made evident by the presence of his pasted in book plate. Did he reciprocate? Did he respond to this pitiable appeal? Did he make a gift of his own, some money, or some other thoughtful tender to this impoverished supplicant? What you may not know is that this was the same shoot Barrington who in 1803 had been president of the London School for the Blind. The same school, admittedly for youth, from which the adult price had been turned away when seeking some educative relief from his recently occurring affliction, when he sought the restoration of some semblance of a productive life. Now, some 15 years later, with this gift of binding, was he seeking to demonstrate to an aloof aristocratic authority this white, what he and others might have accomplished had they been early encouraged and supported in the restoration of their vocational skills. Even prior to this presentation, recalling this rejection in the closing of the 1813 narrative, a disheartened and embittered Price had lamented that there was, as he says, there was no permanent and established manufactory for the blind as the utility, I am persuaded, would be a public good. He believed that educating a blind child for two or three years be of little is, would be of little benefit, as it is generally admitted the blind possess, possess providential gifts, but if these gifts are not encouraged, where is the use of them? They must be entirely lost. Then. Oh, as we have seen, Nathaniel Price's attempt at a revived career as a bookbinder in the, tr in the dark was short-lived. Probably begun around 1812, it was very likely over by 1816, if it went that far. It ended at a time when the binding trade as a whole was troubled and went into serious recession. In 1813, there was the parliamentary end of the Apprenticeship Act, which severely affected the traditional the trade hierarchical structure. And there was a severe economic downturn that swept through post-Waterloo Britain, a time depressingly summarized in, in, in Byron's poem, Darkness. More to the point here, John Jaffrey, the 19th century binder and chronicler of the craft, recalled a great stagnation of business. It was a time, he recalls, when voluntary subscriptions were taught to aid those out of work, when, uh, while others declared they would rather take work at any price than remain out and starve. 
In any case, the sighted binders were struggling for work. In these circumstances, what sort of opportunities would have been available to a dependent and, and dependent blind book binder pained by rheumatism and other afflictions? Here, additional words added by whoever had written the identifying note in the Broxbourne binding become especially pertinent. In consideration of the time, length of time Mr. Price had taken on this book, was he to receive five guineas, it would not produce tuppence per hour. A wonderful instance of patience and perseverance, such is the inestimable blessing of sight, he ponders over that an hour which he could formerly do in five minutes. That makes it hardly worth Price's trouble, much less the time of any willing collaborator. Price never seems to, to have been heard again. At best, we can just hope that he did not end up like these blind beggars, their fam then familiar sight sorts of figures on the streets of London. We know the bad circumstances of his death in Old Fish Street, but of his end we know nothing. Just when did, he, when, just when did the earned for dissolution come? Now the other bookend, this final note. The, <clears throat> going back to my introductory remarks about the hierarchical nature of the trade, and with it the problem of signature, the mark of a master's authority, the sign of I made this, Nathaniel Price seems to have spent the bulk of his professional life as a journeyman binder, working for others in America, or perhaps even doing some unsigned trade binding in the early years of his book selling in Norwich or later in Bristol. When cited, it is unlikely that he was ever in a position to affix his name to a cover as a master. It was only after he was blinded and resumed binding in London that he was known to complete several bindings, all with his name as the maker prominently displayed on the spine. The sadness is that emerging at last as a master binder in the dark, he was, alas, no longer in a position to see his own signed work. Thank you. <laughs> Arthur, thank you so much for that uh, extraordinary lecture. Thank you. Metic meticulous and extraordinary research about a most extraordinary, extraordinary life. We have time for um, some questions and comments. Possibly rather technical question, Arthur, but first of all, thank you very much for a fascinating tale. Um, the Broxbourne binding is really not bad, <laughs> while the other one you showed with the rosettes on the spine is a complete and utter right. mess. Now, would it be... The, would the reason be that if you do, if you use a row along the edge, you can actually use a straight edge along which you can use the row. Well, if you have to do um, to, to two rosettes out of hand, then, well, it's anybody's guess where they go right, if you they can't are. see. Yeah. I mean, I th the, the, the question I sort of asked myself at one point was, you know, was, he, was it hand on hand that he was working? Was he guiding his hand and so forth? I mean, I, I understand that you know he could, using one finger just along the edge, he could easily, yeah, or easily do it. Maybe whereas the other, with the straight edge, for the others, he so would, that you don't go too yeah, far. For the rosette, if it was to be centered, yeah, I mean, we have exactly. to say, "Fine, my hand." I was yeah. wondering because it looks so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the difference is striking, and, and this one, I mean, this is really a handsome binding. Yeah, as, not that, anyhow. As, compo as compared to the, as compared to Mr. Middleton's binding. And he did this one. Well, he was experienced. I don't know. Uh, I mean, who knows how many bindings he did as a, well, as a blind person? Only four survived. Only four are known who survived. Nicholas. Thank you very much. Fascinating stuff. And, and I was looking at the lettering on the spines. And this one here um, didn't show me what I was hoping to see. Because in the Middleton binding, it's quite clear he was using a type holder which would have enabled him to get all the letters squared up in a, in a straight line, even, or, if, even if that straight or, or line whoever was crooked. Was help, or whoever was helping him. Yeah, well, the straight line was crooked right. on the Middleton binding, but at least it was straight. Um, whereas perfectly, I can see here, looks as if it's done with handle letters, because um, all the letters are slightly twisted. Um, and that can't have been done, I think, in a type holder, whereas the lines above bound by price are very regular and even. And I suspect he was using a type holder, maybe didn't realize he'd screwed it up slightly crooked. Um, <laughs> Because that would have enabled him. I'm to sure get he the never. Re I'm sure he never realised it. Sadly, no. But it would have enabled him to do the right. lettering, which is actually one of the trickiest things to get right. Um, but it would be interesting to see just if 
with the book in hand, as it were, if you can see whether there are different depths of letter and all that sort of thing. Um, but he was using whatever he could, I think, to, to get it as accurate mm -hmm. as possible. Uh, and I think the comment about the rolls is probably true. You could run it up a straight edge. Um, but maybe he burnt his thumb with that, uh, <laughs> with the rosette way off to the left, halfway <laughs> down the spine, I don't know. No, uh, I've seen binders with good sight who've done worse. <laughs> 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 Join the chorus, wonderful talk. I'm curious about the structure of the bindings. I, I see the finishing, but yeah. like, you know, do you know anything about the end papers? I do not, uh, no. I, I, uh, I mean, the only way you can, you can't see all the end papers, but if I go, if I went back to the very beginning, uh, where, you, where you see the, oh, here you go. No, not that one. That's, can you see it? No, you can see a little bit of the, at least the inside cover. Oops, sorry. You read a, uh, a comment about him employing a, a boy to thread his needle. A boy when he was making his tailor. Yeah, but I think it probably would have been the same for the binder as well. Oh, well okay. yeah, he must have had some. Okay. Assistant like somewhere a, along a, the a line. Printed devil, a printed yep. 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 This is not a bookbinding question, but how on earth did he escape then chained to the floor? Oh, he, well, he, what happened was. <laughs> Somebody smuggled a file into him. I assume it might have been Quinguinia, although his two cellmates were well-seasoned convicts and probably had good local friends. They couldn't file through the chains. So basically what happened was the chains were connected to a cuff, roughly shaped like that, with a bolt across. But the bolt was bolted, and this guy was just strong enough. He worked all day, and he finally loosened the bolt, and that's how he got out. Right. Yes, yes, from his own account. Uh, yeah, he make, oh, he makes that quite clear. That, thank you very much for that very remarkable story. Um, I wanted just to pick up what you said about the hierarchy of the trade. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I, I, I was interested in one of the advertisements from the 1790s, I think the Greenleaf advertisement that you showed, where it said, if I'm right in it, 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 it said that okay. he was employing a binder at an extraordinary salary and I wondered oh. quite, quite what that meant in the context of an advertisement. <laughs> um, and, and whether you had any thoughts right. on that, because right. he, he, after the bit about the extraordinary salary, he then says something, does he, about the cost of the binding. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't <laughs> sure how the two related to one another. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know what, what uh, he would have charged at all. <laughs> I mean, was it an extraordinarily high or extraordinarily low? I think it was extraordinarily I low. I think it was question. extraordinarily low, yes. yes. Yeah. Right. Just extraordinary low. I have nothing else to tell you. <laughs> I, I wanted to add one funny note. Uh, this, this issue about the exiled printers and so forth is one that's quite fascinating, and uh, I think the whole notion of a network uh, of, of printers, particularly those with Anglo-American connections and so forth, but there is a paper that was done in 2011 by a man named Edelman for the library company in Philadelphia. And he has an appendix, and I was looking at it the other day, and he lists between Irish, English, and Scottish printers, get publishers, whatever, he, he has 13 names of people who came to America between 93 and 96. So it was a real issue, I mean, The word, the, word, the word extraordinary is very very common indeed in 18th century parlance. It's obviously got that great usefulness. You gave us an extraordinary lecture tonight uh, in, the, in the very best sense of the word. So thank you very much for giving us our annual lecture, our annual lecture on binding in such a wonderful way. Thank and can you. I just ask everyone once again to thank you so much indeed.